Let's look at another algorithm named map that is a higher order function and apply some of these same con concepts, but a little bit differently. So if you could imagine we have an input piece of data like a string, uh, the word dog, and we have some function, right? And I'm just gonna name that function f generically for now, and we apply that function to our input string. You can imagine this function f does something like transforms the string dog into the length of the string, such as say three. Or maybe we have a input that value is two and we have some other function named f and we call f of two and what does it do? Well, it gives back uh, the number four, it squares it. Or maybe we have two and we have a function f that we call with that input and it gives back a string value that's like, uh, two is even, right? We could write a function that returns a string that, that gives the number followed by whether or not it's even or odd with some if then. The point is we can imagine uh, a common scenario where we have a function that takes a single piece of data as an input and processes it to have some output, right? So the map algorithm says, okay, well, if we can do this for a single piece of data, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a list of data and say, hey, on that whole list of data, call function f and make a new list of data that is the resulting outputs of each of those function calls. And that's exactly what map is. So let's break this down a little bit more visually. So let's break this down a little more visually. So map is this idea that given an input list, and here you can imagine an input list and I'm arbitrarily choosing A, B, C, and D as, as made up values, right? These could be strings, these could be numbers, they could be objects. Right now, this doesn't matter, but assume they're all of the same type. Uh, and then we're gonna have a transform function f that works on a single value at a time, right? So it doesn't work on a list at a time. The transform function f works on one value at a time. And so what map will do is map will say, okay, if you give me f, I'm going to move through this list of values and call that function f with each one of my inputs, right? So map is going to uh, call f with the a, the first value in this list, with the second value in this list, with the third value in this list, and the fourth value. And as it's doing this, the algorithm is building up a new list that gets returned back to you. So whatever the result of calling f of a is would be a prime, and that is what would be the first value of the returned list. Same with b, b prime, c, c prime. So you get the point, right? We take a function that if we could apply it to only a single value, with the map algorithm, we can apply it to every value in a list and get it back a new list with all of the returned values in it, right? So if we want to imagine uh, how would this work in co context with how would we specify a functional interface for the transform function? Well, this is a function that needs two generic types, right? So if we want to be able to have a function that can uh, process some input of one type, right? So maybe the input is number, such as in this example, and can output some other type, uh, such as a string, two is even. Uh, we need to be able to specify a type for this function f. And we know that if we were thinking about this function specifically, it would have an input type of a uh, number and a return type of string, right? And so we have two different types here that this function will operate on. Uh, and they both need to be able to be generic if we wanna be able to take a input list of type number and return an output list of type string with the map algorithm. We need to be able to specify a generic function that can have two generic types as part of its definition. Right? And so here we're gonna see that with the transform function T and U, right? And so if we wanted to specify what is a transform function, well, this is gonna be any function that uh, you can call it with some input type T and it will return to you some output type U, right? Now, this is more flexible than when we use two T's, right? When we use two T's, those T's for any given use need to be the same because that's the same type placeholder. But for T and U, they can be anything. In fact, they can even be the same. So T and U could be the same if we wanted to make a function uh, that uh, that returned, uh, say, that took in a number and returned a number. So let's imagine two examples here. So one example is a function uh, like the one we're seeing here. Give it a string and it returns to you a number. The number that it's returning is the length of that string. 
And another example is if you give it a string and we just want to convert that string to uppercase, right? So it's okay for T and U to be the same. But what this definition of a functional interface named transform for the generic types T and U gives us the flexibility to choose is that we can choose that T and U are different, all right? So we can actually go take a look at this in some code. Uh, and before we jump into the example that makes use of this and we do some live coding together, I wanna just walk through uh, the implementation of map that you can imagine. So we've got our input list of node type T and a function that's the transform function that will transform from T to U. What I want you to notice is that the output type here is node type U, or so we've got a list of type U. And what's, what's the idea here? Again, if we imagine our input is T and we pass T to F, where uh, F is going to return something of type U, then this is us mapping a list of input type T through a function that takes in a T and returns a U and gives back to us a U, all right? So the base case is very straightforward, right? There's, uh, when we get to the empty list, we return the empty list. And then if we think about, well, what's the recursive case? Well, notice uh, we're conting and we're processing the first element. So this is our pattern here. Process the first element. And how are we processing that element? Well, notice that we are calling the F function on the first value of our list. So we are. this is us literally processing that, that first value by taking this function and applying it to the first value of our list. And then we're conting that onto this same process or same algorithm applied to the rest of the list, right? And so uh, this is us applying the map algorithm to the rest of the list. And all we're doing is just passing that function f, that transform function, on to the next call to map, right? And so this is what would build up our list one by one by processing the first element and conting it on to the rest of the list, right? Applied uh, or, or processing that map algorithm. Great. So there's an example code file today that is the O3 file. That's the last we're going to look at. We're going to save reduce for next time. And uh, let's just play around with this for a bit. So we've got, uh, this is the O3 map app example. I've got an input list of numbers, one, two, three, five, eleven, And we are going to try and write a, uh, to square every number in this list. So how would we write a function that squares every number in this list? Well, we could go write a brand new recursive function to go move through that process, take in a list that has numbers, return a list of squared numbers, but we're gonna try and do this with map. And so we've defined our functional interface transform that's generic from for both T and U. And so next we're going to try and define a function named square, right? So what I'd like you to try and do is pause the program here or pause the video here and try and change the program such that you define a function named square that would be a transform function. It takes in a number and it returns the square of that number. All right, so we can say let square be a function that takes in some number n and we can name that parameter anything we want, right? Because the name of a parameter only matters inside of the function body and it returns a number. And how do we implement this function? Well, we can return n to the power of two, right? Or we could have returned n times n, same thing. Uh, and if we wanted to convince ourselves, hey, is this actually a, a transform function? We could explicitly type this square uh, name and say square is of type transform number number, right? Now that gets to be pretty verbose, uh, but I just wanted to do it to show you that this is in fact uh, valid, right? We're saying there's a variable named square who is actually a trans, is, that variable is gonna hold a function that is of type transform from number to number. Uh, and so if I had accidentally made this a string, notice that we would have had an error here. It says square is, uh, the, the error that you see here is type string number is not assignable to type transform number to number, right? Because Transform number to number means both T and U need to be numbers, so the parameter we expected was number. Now, if, if we had specified this as transform from string to number, that would have been fine. Uh, but this is a function that we're transforming from a number to a number. We don't actually have to explicitly type that. We can uh, just 
rely on the uh, programming language to infer, hey, if I've got a function that, that takes in a number and returns a number, then by definition, that, that function is a transform function. Like it, it, it can be classified as a transform function where t is number and u is number. All right, so we've got a transform function. We just looked at the implementation of map, which is reproduced from the slide uh, in code down here. And so now what we're gonna do is try calling that function. So map, and what are we mapping? We're mapping our numbers using this transform function named square. All right. So when I save this, we see that uh, the output shows the squared values of 1, 2, 3, 5, 11 are 1, 4, 9, 25, 121, right? So it looks like that worked. And that's pretty cool. Notice all we needed to do was define a function that could work for a single number to, that processed a single number. And if we wanted to process a whole list of numbers, we can map that function over the input list of numbers using this generic map algorithm, right? And just to uh, prove to ourselves that we could do the same thing with say uh, names, which is going to be a list of uh, Roy, Ramses, and uh, I don't know, Kevin G, right? These are three strings and we can also map those strings and names with a function that we haven't yet defined yet, but let's, let's call it string to length, right? And I'm just gonna define this function right here, which will be a transform function. So let string to length be a function that you give it a string value, uh, and I'll just name that parameter s. s is a string, and it's going to return to us a number. And so uh, we're just going to return s.length. Right? So the length property of a string uh, is uh, a number type, right? And so if we give a string to this string to length transform function, then it will return to us the, the number of characters it has in it. And when we print the output of mapping names using this function, notice we get the length of each of those strings, three characters, seven and seven, right? And if we wanted to, we could be explicit here and say this is a transform function from string to number. And we wouldn't have any, uh, this would still check out. Again, if I tried to say from number to number here, we would have a problem and that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but this is implicitly inferred by our programming language String to length, because it satisfies this transform interface, uh, we could say that it belongs in the family of transform functions and, and, and the programming language knows it's a transform from string to number. And that's what allows us to use it as a parameter to this function f in map, right? And just as one final example, let's imagine a yell function. That is a, another transform function. We give it a string. It's going to give back to us a string. And what it's going to do is uh, return s dot to uppercase. Right? So there's a built-in method of strings. Strings have some properties of objects that we haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about. But if you imagine a string as an object that has some methods, one of the things you can do with a string is convert all of its lowercase characters to uppercase characters using this built-in method that's part of our programming language named to uppercase. And so now if I were to say print map names and yell, oops, and I need a semicolon instead of a colon, uh, notice that we get back a list of names where each of the input names uh, applied this function of converting the input string to a, a, a capitalized string. And notice this worked for a single string at a time. But with the map function, what it gives us the ability to do is take a function that works on one value and applies that same function to all values in a list, right? And this is a, a workhorse, as you can imagine, if you would otherwise have needed to write a recursive function to do all of this. But just like filter, we can specify now just what is the, 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 the instructions I want to apply to one value and you can figure out a uh, map algorithm how to manage applying that to all values in a list and just give me back the list of values uh, that uh, you processed. Right? So this is another classic higher order function that is often used in conjunction with filter. And there's one more of these classic functions named reduce, which we'll look at in the next lecture.